baseball is a dolphin fan. And he had these dolphins that he wanted to feed the livers to so that they could live longer. And what did he get arrested for? Transporting minors across state lines for immortal porpoises. Okay, that was that was a long setup. Sorry about that. Okay, um, usually you hear the parable of ten of the talents, and you're familiar with the parable of the talents. You're probably not as familiar with the parable of the ten minas because nobody preaches on this because it is such a difficult and strange passage. Calissa said last week that this was something she wanted to avoid. She thought I should preach on something else. And we're moving to Philippians. You know, you kind of prefigured that for us, Christopher. We're moving to Philippians for four weeks here pretty soon. And Philippians is easy to preach on. Philippians preaches itself. All you just have to do is read it and share it. And Philippians preaches itself. But this is about the minas. Now, Matthew calls them talents. And a group of minas is a talent. They can be uh, thought of in both ways. But uh, in Luke, it's called the parable of the pounds or the parable of the minas. In Matthew, it's different. They give one person five, one person two, and one person one. Here in Luke, he just gives 10 talents to these slaves, and it seems like each of them has one. Now, I also found that mina is, uh, is, a, is a blockchain technology, if anybody knows more about that than I do. But my, the mina is a blockchain technology for you uh, crypto people in here. But uh, the mina, let's go to the next slide. The mina uh, was a basic standard of weight. That's why it's also called the parable of the pounds. It's a, a standard of weight among ancient Hebrews and the sacred system of weights. And the mina was equal to 60 shekels or six and 60 sacred minas equaled one talent. So you can see where perhaps it was a talent and perhaps it was um, a mina. I mean, it's a parable. It's a story. It's not a literal story. It's such a strange and painful story. And uh, later on in Jewish usage, the mina became 100 denarii, and it was about a quarter's wages. Uh, in the Old Testament, you see the mina. Solomon's reported to have 300 shields, each with three mina of gold. Uh, then uh, the king of Persia donates 5,000 mina of silver for the reconstruction of Solomon's temple. So there are some allusions to it in the Old, Te Old Testament. But this is how this strange parable begins. We've just heard the story of Zacchaeus. Do you remember Zacchaeus? Where was Zacchaeus? Up in a tree. And what was his work? He was a tax collector. He was a wealthy man. He was a tax collector. And after they heard about that, and uh, Jesus describes him as a son of Abraham to whom God is bringing good news. That's when we, in verse 10, move into this. So as they were listening to Jesus talk about Zacchaeus and how the kingdom of God is coming and, and connecting with someone like Zacchaeus, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. So we started in 951. If you remember back in the beginning of Lent, uh, we turned our faces toward Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is that way uh, in this room. It's like through that panel. And so we turned our faces toward Jerusalem. And Jesus in 951 in Luke turns his face to Jerusalem. And this is what's called the travel narrative in Luke. You move from 951 to about the end of 19. And now we're just outside of Jerusalem. So he's near Jerusalem. And he said this because they supposed that the kingdom of God was about to appear immediately. You go back to Zacchaeus and it says, today salvation has come to your house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and save the lost. And in the midst of hearing about what the son of man came to do, he tells this story. He tells this parable. And there are several reasons. He says, because he's near Jerusalem, and because he's near Jerusalem, this is the key to the kingdom's arrival. Uh, prophets were to be killed in Jerusalem. You know that we're moving towards sort of the climax of the story, but it's not really an end point. It's the beginning, because later in Luke, they say, beginning from Jerusalem and to Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, and they told to wait into the, in the city until they received power from on high. And they're expecting the kingdom to come instantly. Jesus was the Messiah, and they expected the Messiah to bring world peace. And they thought world peace was going to be instantaneous. And that didn't happen, uh, as we know. We're still struggling with peace in our world. Can you believe we're still struggling in Ukraine? I mean, it's just a, a painful thing. You, you, thought, you think there's going to be some resolution. It continues to get worse and worse. Uh, and that was brought into even more clarity for us as we walked among the graves in Normandy. 
and my wife and I, as we walked through those graves at Normandy, just looked at each other and just said, what will these graves look like in Ukraine in the days ahead? What will they look like? You think that uh, we're getting beyond uh, that kind of warring, and, and yet we're not. And so they supposed the kingdom of God was about to appear, and instead Jesus goes away. That's just not exactly what they were doing, what they were hoping. Jesus goes away. So uh, Jesus talks a lot about money. This is about money. Uh, and he talks about how that we deal with our possessions. And our fourth core value that we've been dealing with is sharing more. So look at your neighbor and tell them that our fourth core value is sharing more. And it's sharing more of our time, talent, treasure, and true selves. Got it? Sharing more of our time, sharing more of our talent, sharing more of our treasures, and sharing more of our true selves. And I think that's part of what Bill was talking about with Stephen ministry is a lot of times, especially as men, we don't get down to our true selves. We're not willing to share our true selves and become as vulnerable as we need to be. And in the intimacy of a relationship with a Stephen minister, you're able to share your true selves and so we're, we're looking as a church to strengthen each other by sharing more, and we share more because we need and want less for ourselves. Uh, one of the things I'm probably going to talk about is uh, Parkinson's Law. I know about Parkinson's, but you ever heard of Parkinson's Law? It says that uh, the work will expand to the time you have, or that your expenses will increase to the money you earn, Right? And that more money is very seldom the answer to money issues. More money just exacerbates your difficult relationship with money. If you can't deal with a little bit of money, you won't deal with more money any better unless you become more disciplined. So we'll talk about that perhaps a little on Sunday. Our four core values are seeking Christ by seeing Christ in others and being Christ to others, showing love by showing up. And that's been in, that one is especially inspired, I think I told you a few weeks ago, by a couple of men in this room. Showing love by showing up. Serving big by serving in big and small ways. And sharing more by needing and wanting less. And this story seems to be about the proper use of our possessions while we await the return of the king. While we're waiting, we're waiting for that return. And this sense of immediacy is what they were used to. I mean, they were thinking that the kingdom of God was going to come immediately. If you read the gospel of Mark, it's over and over again, immediately, 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 and then, and next, and next. There's a sense of urgency in Mark. It slows down a little bit in Luke and in, in Matthew, and then John is written in about the year 90, and things have, it's just 60 years of waiting. And after 60 years of waiting, how many times does John use immediately? Twice. Okay, there's this, this sense of immediacy has waned and the people are struggling because they thought that the kingdom was going to come more quickly than in fact it did. Some people call this the parable of 10 pounds and that's what I did freshman year and that's what I did as a week in England. I, I, I lost pounds as I, as I spent them. And you, do you know that uh, you have to turn in your 20 and 50 pound notes? And we thought it was because the queen had died and they're going to change the image on the notes. It's not true. It just happened to coincide with our time there. There was a sense of urgency, the sense of immediacy that you need to turn in your 20 and 50 pound notes because if you don't, they'll be worthless. In fact, one of the women in the church gave me some of her paper 20 pound notes to take with, with me and to spend on the group because she said they'll be worthless if I don't send them with you. And I said, that seems really strange that the queen has died and they're going to flip their currency like that. No, they've been in a long term movement to make their currency kind of plasticky. I mean, have you ever felt like a pound and, and it's more more of plastic than paper? And that just happened to coincide with the queen's death. It had nothing to do with the queen's death. But by the end of September, you have to turn in your paper notes or they'll be worthless. And so imagine having a fortune in your stuffed in your mattress or finding a bunch of money and finding those notes are worthless. And they're trying to deal with um, with uh, count with with uh, forgeries and counterfeits. And this new technology is a way to help them do that. And so they're getting away, getting rid of that. Uh, this particular parable is really two stories twisted around each other. 
Uh, it's the only way to try and resolve it and try and understand it. It's as though two stories have been enmeshed and it's hard to preach on because they're kind of two different narratives that are happening at the same time. So let's walk through it and see if we can figure it out. So Jesus said, a nobleman went to a distant region to receive royal power for himself and then return. This is not at all what it says in, in Matthew. Matthew's like, this guy goes away. But here he goes away to receive royal power. He summoned 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 pounds and said to them, do business with these until I return. In the Greek, it says, be pragmatic with these. Trade with them. Be pragmatic with these. Do business with these until I come back. But the citizens of his country hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. Is that weird? I mean, that is just a strange passage. And so in a sense, there are two stories. There's a story about a nobleman going away to receive royal power. And there's a second story about what he does with the people that work for him. So think of it that way. So you have one story about people who are entrusted with something while he's gone and another story about his own journey toward power. Then comes the next verses. Uh, they're not really the next verses, but this is what we know. And we think this may have something to do with this story. Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great, upon his father's death, went to Rome to be crowned his father's successor. But he was so despised that a Jewish embassy of 50 persons went to Rome to protest. And he was not made king, but only ruled over Judea and only for a short time. Uh, so we think that this story may have been woven into this story as it was told um, about uh, a son trying to take over for his father. And imagine uh, their discussion. What do you think it would have been like with those slaves who've been given basically <clears throat> 10 quarters of their wages? Okay, you get you get two and a half years wages, and you around the table have to decide what to do. What it seems like they did is they split it up in an egalitarian way. Everybody got one to try and figure out what to do with. And what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? And so the question <clears throat> that we ask about this part of the story is, where do we put our trust? Do we put our trust in our possessions, or do we put, put ourselves our, our trust in God? Even our money says in God we trust. But sometimes I think we trust our money more than we do God. So when he comes back, this is what happens when he comes back. When he returned, having received royal power, he ordered these slaves to whom he'd given the money to come in for a performance review. Y'all love the good performance review? <clears throat> How many of you love doing performance reviews? Okay, a couple of y'all. Okay. Uh, so he ordered those slaves to whom he'd given the money to be summoned so that he might find out what they'd gain by doing business. The first came forward and said, Lord, your pounds made 10 more pounds. And he said to him, well done, good slave. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small thing, you're going into government. I mean, isn't that strange? Because you've been trustworthy in a little, I will also make you. Right. I mean, aren't we used to saying I will make you trustworthy in much? You know, if I give you a little, then I'll also trust you to much. Instead, he says, I'm going to entrust you with 10 cities. And the other guy, he says, uh, then the second came, Lord, your pounds made five pounds. He said to them, and you get to roll over five cities, like northern DeKalb County. Fran, this is you. <laughs> yes, th this is this may be the thought that goes into political appointments. Okay, keep going. Next slide. So your faithfulness need leads to a role in government. Uh, I don't think that's exactly what he expected. What we expect is Matthew 25. Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. That's the one we quote. We don't quote this one. I'll put you in charge of 10 cities. I'll put you in charge of five cities. And the parable of the pounds then goes like this. We get to the last person. The other came saying, Lord, here's your pound. I wrapped it up in a piece of cloth for I was afraid of you. I didn't bury it in the ground like with the talents. I wrapped it up in a piece of cloth because I was afraid, because you're a harsh man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And the returning nobleman, who's now full of royal power, said to him, I'll judge you by your own words, you wicked slave. You knew, did you, that I was a harsh man taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow? Well, then, did you not put my money in the bank? And then I returned. I could have collected it with interest. Uh, there are issues about usury, but I'm not going to go into those. Let's skip those two slides. 
Uh, we, we don't have time for usury today. And then he said to the bystander, this, this is a harsh story. This is a difficult story. Then he said to those who were standing by, take the pound from him and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. But the bystanders are worried about this. And they said, Lord, he already has 10 pounds. How can you take this one away? I tell you, to all those who have, more will be given. But from those who have nothing, even that, what they, even what they have will be taken away. And then it gets better. But as for these any enemies of mine who did not want me to rule over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. This is the good news, according to Luke. <laughs> I mean, it, it, so you can see why it feels like two stories woven together. One about a nobleman who goes away. And Andy, it's often thought about as Jesus is the one who goes away receives royal power and comes back to judge, comes back to get an accounting, comes back to do an employee review, a performance review of all of us. But um, there, there's sort of, you know, two levels to the story. The first level is what did you do with what was entrusted to you? Did you do what I asked you to do, which was multiply it? Or did you wrap it up and sit on it because you were afraid? And I think the question echoes for all of us, what are we doing with what God has entrusted to us? And are we using it to multiply God's goodness and grace? Are we holding on to it? Are we holding on to it for ourselves? And then there's this other secondary story that is about, I think, um, partly about Archelaus, but also uh, it is about that there will come a time uh, of judgment for us all. We don't want that to be true. But it seems like that uh, there will be, come a time when we are called to account. And so you have these two things. In Matthew, it says, as this for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the one who is punished in the Matthew story is the one who doesn't do what they're told. The one in the Luke story are all the people who did not want to be put under the authority of the ruler. So there's a little bit of a difference there. It's not uh, the disobedience. It's not the fear that has them condemned in the gospel of Luke. What has them condemned in the gospel of Luke is an unwillingness to put themselves under the king's authority and to be under their own authority. So there's still a story about Archelaus. I wouldn't be able to fight if he came home and had all the people slaughtered. Right. 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 And that story gets woven into this parable later on. So it, it feels like you've got the Matthew story. And then the Archelaus story that gets woven into it. And even some of the biblical commentators feel like those st two stories have been conflated. But I'm going to try and preach it anyway. World's greatest. So pray for me this week. Thank you. Um, and my mother's already prayed for me this morning. She turns 92 tomorrow. So that is a, a good day. So these are the questions for you to ponder as we struggle. What makes you impatient? And how do you occupy yourself while you're waiting? Because that's really what this story is about, is what do we do while we wait for justice? What do we do while we wait for the return of the king? What do we do in the meantime? Are we mean in the meantime? And how do we live out our core values of sharing more by needing and want to let less? How might you share more of your time, your talent, your treasure, and your true self? I've, I've appreciated some of the true self sharing around these tables. And I think that's one of the reasons that we come week and week, week, not to listen to, to what's said from this place, but what's said around the table. Where might you need to simplify in your life? One of the most important things we did when we went to Normandy is as we were leaving Normandy, we asked anybody who had a connection to World War II to share their stories. And it was probably, David, I think the most powerful moment for me on the trip uh, as people stood up and shared about how their dads had gone to war. And some had come back and some had not. And it was, a, it was a moving experience as we heard those stories driving back to Paris from Normandy. Uh, where might you need to simplify your life? 
Is there anywhere in your life that needs to be simplified? Why are people so uncomfortable in talking about money? Um, you know, money is, uh, is not the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Uh, and, you know, it, the, we're invited to share a portion of what has been entrusted to us, but people really struggle with that. I watch it. People really struggle with sharing a portion of what's been entrusted to them. One of the great things about John Wesley is he made 30 pounds a year. He lived on 27 and gave three back to God's work. And then he made 60 pounds a year and he lived on 27 and gave the rest to God's work. And then he made like 90 pounds a year. And then what did he do? He still lived on 27, but we tend to expand our expenses to the income we've been entrusted with. And that is a very difficult thing to be disciplined about. Is there anything you need to take an October fast from? I have on my watch, it comes up when I, when I come up my watch, I have a picture of these uh, Eclair hot dogs that Robert and I got when we were at the Seven Dials Market. And I have a, a note to myself, October fast. So every time I look at my watch, it's a reminder that I'm having an October fast and there's some things I'm giving up during October that I need to fast from in order to simplify my life. So I know some of you are thinking October fast, but I want you to also think about perhaps October fast. And finally, who taught you the importance of being a good steward of what God has entrusted to you? And what's one key lesson that stayed with you? And if you answer no other questions, I hope you'll at least answer that last one around the table. Thanks for listening to this crazy story this morning as we try to figure out what God wants us to do with what's been entrusted to us.